Good morning. I'm on now. Great. My name is Pastor Rob, and as you were already warned, uh, I'll be preaching for you this morning. Pastor Jerry, this was planned, but not that planned. Like, he was supposed to be here um, helping with the kids downstairs, um, but I got a text from him at 2.30 last night, and usually I, I don't wake up to texts, but I woke up to this one for some reason, being like, hey, Rob, I'm not going to be there. There's a decision that you're supposed to make because I won't be there, so make it. So I made a decision, and I'm going to invite Gwen up. And Gwen, why don't you uh, use Marcus's microphone over there? Oh, you've got a handheld. Wonderful. Um, so Gwen has a project that Cambrian Heights Baptist Church had been doing for a long time. That Pathway Church, well, we haven't done it because we, well, we merged in January. And we'd like to continue doing this project um, for this year. And uh, Gwen has those details. Okay, so Christmas is coming, and we all think of gifts. And um, Pathway at Cambrian is going to give the gift of food to three families here in Calgary. Our families um, are identified by North Central Family Services. And we just want to put together just a beautiful gift of food that for sure includes all the fixings for a Christmas dinner, plus some staples that are going to help them for a little bit after, because January can be a really hard month. So, in the foyer, we have a Christmas tree that has ornaments on it. But these are not ordinary ornaments. All of the ornaments have an item listed on... I'm very loud. Uh, yeah, I hold usually, the microphone closer to your mouth. Closer? Yeah, That makes go. it loud. I don't want it loud. It has to be louder. It has to... Okay. I used to be a cheerleader. I usually don't need microphones. Um, so on the ornaments are items that are to go into the hamper. So this one says shampoo and conditioner. This one says canned soup or stew. This one has stuffing, aluminum tray and foil. And you might ask, well, they're different colors. Do you want to know why? They're different colors to make my job easier. So when you bring your items to go into the hampers, I'll know which family it goes to by the color of your ornament. So um, after service, go and have a look in the tree. You get to choose which items you want to put into the hampers. You may take more than one if you wish. And if you're someone like me who things grow legs in my house and go somewhere, um, I'm happy to write down on a paper which ones you picked and what color you picked so that later on we'll know where they go. And as a coincidence, when you come to hear the beautiful music on December 22nd, that's, that's the, the due date to bring all your items to go into our hampers. Any ask me later. So all of November, we are dedicated to talking about how we as church members and our church believers, not even if you come to Pathway, but just in general, we are all responsible to give of the plenty that we have. So kids, that also applies to you guys. I know you're like, uh-oh, he's talking to us now. When you guys have a lot, which I'm sure many of you do, it's your job to share with those who don't have a lot. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus died for us to be able to do. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more this morning. But before I get started there, mistaken identity is quite a thing. I remember when I was, well, probably about your size, looking a lot like you. I picked you because you have blonde hair, and I'm sorry, you're turning very red. Um, when I was about your age, I remember at church one time, I hurt myself really badly. I tried jumping down some stairs, and I hurt my leg, like really hurt my leg. I tore my ligaments, which is a way of saying it was an owie. Um, and so I was in pain. I was crying, right? And I was kind of limping, trying to find my mother. And I went to a church that was about this size of church. And I see in the distance some blonde lady. And I hobble my way towards this blonde lady. And I say, Mom, 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 I hurt myself. And this person turns down, and it is not my mother. Right? So not only am I in pain Physically, I'm in pain emotionally because I'm so embarrassed that I just grabbed this stranger and said, ow. 
Um, I have another story about uh, mistaken identity. Um, who here loves their job? <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to lie to me. You can be honest. It's fine. Um, I prefer the honesty thing. I have a story here of someone who I think loved their job because there's no other reason that they would do what they did. He was a staff member at uh, the, I'm going to butcher this, so forgive me, at Lolo Pacwe uh, in Terranife. I don't know where that is. I have no idea. Uh, Spanish, Spain. There. It's in, it's in my notes. It's in Spain. So I said that in French when I should have been trying a Spanish pronunciation. I apologize. Anyways, he's a staff member who dressed up in an ape suit. So I don't know if you caught that, but the place that I butchered is a zoo. And he decided to wear an ape costume. I don't know why. Spanish people are just crazy. No. Um, and he decided to wear this dinosaur, or sorry, gorilla costume on the day that the zoo was having an emergency drill. An emergency animal has got out sort of drill. Yeah. And so here he is trying to be, you know, the best employee he can be. Be really, you know, just kind of with this, you know, I'm assuming, right, with this gorilla costume, right, trying his best to, to make the people that are gathered there think, oh, no, it's an escaped animal. Well, unfortunately, communication isn't this zoo's best, you know, best strength, I guess is the way I should put it. There was a guard there. And guards at zoos often have tranquilizer rifles. Now, kids, tranquilizers are uh, <laughs> fancy chemicals that make people fall asleep, and animals. And this tranquilizer gun had a pretty significant dosage in it. In fact, the dosage in this tranquilizer gun was so powerful, it is meant to drop, I mean drop, a 400-pound gorilla. And we have Mr. Friend running around dressed up like a gorilla. Yes, thank you. They should stay in the service more often. So he gets shot. He gets tranquilized. Boom. Bam! <laughs> Down goes our friend here. They didn't publish his name in the article, which is probably a mercy. <laughs> All right, I think it's really funny. The man suffered an allergic reaction to the dart and was taken to the university hospital. So not only is it a tranquilizer meant to just tranquilize things, but he's allergic to it too. Don't worry, he lived. That would have been, it kind of already was bad, but it could have been a lot worse. Mistaken identity has consequences. History is full of people being sent to prison because it was that guy, and it wasn't. And I was going to share some of them, but most of them are really depressing. There's like a story of one guy serving 15 years in jail, only to be released of a 19-year sentence. 15 years, and they figured, oh, sorry, wrong guy. Can you imagine? 15 years of your life. And you're like, I didn't do it. And they're like, yeah, everybody says that, buddy. We're going to be talking about identity this morning and how our identity is found within Christ. Our identity is found within Jesus. We're going to be taking our time this morning in Galatians chapter, or cha yeah, Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, to Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, because, hey, spoiler alert, the chapters in the Bible, are, they're like soft suggestions. Sometimes subjects kind of carry over chapters a little bit in the Bible. If you don't have your Bible with you, it will be up on the slide this morning. So, uh, Colleen, if I could have my first slide, please, and we'll begin our reading. Well, the first thing I want you to think of this morning is, in Christ we are justified. So, in Christ we are justified, and we'll talk about what that means in a second here. So, next slide, please. So, starting here at verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified, there's the big word, justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. 
because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, I'm going to tell you guys what justified means really quickly here. Justified means that the law has no hold on you anymore. You were once guilty, and you are now justified. Right? You were once in trouble, and now you are guilt-free. Right? And how does that happen? How does that work? Well, that works through faith. And what is faith? It's belief. Put a period in it. I'm all done. I can go home now. Okay, so a lot of you in this room have been Christians maybe your entire life. Maybe you were baptized very young. Maybe you came to it much later. And thank you for coming. Maybe you're a guest here this morning and you're still not sure if you really believe in this whole God and Jesus thing, yet something inside of you has propelled you to come to church this morning. But this right here, this little book, Galatians, sums up the entire Bible. And this highlighted phrase here, of which we'll look at many, is the entirety of the scriptures, more or less. A person is not justified by works of the law. What does that mean? A person is not good just because they do good things. Is that kind of weird to you? Yeah? Right, yeah, exactly. So usually, when someone does good things, we say, hey, that's a good person. Frankie shovels his neighbor's driveway. Frankie's a good person, right? No! <laughs> JP comes to this church every second Monday and leads a men's Bible study. That's a great thing. They don't pay him. They pay me to do stuff like that, and I conned it off on him somehow. Is JP a good person? No! no. <laughs> Does that seem a little counterintuitive to you? Yes! Yeah. And the, see, the world, the way the world works is, this is like the whole karma thing, right? You do good things, good things will happen to you. You do bad things, bad things will happen to you. Then how come a lot of bad people have a lot of money and power? How come the bad guys in, like, Marvel movies and stuff are rich? Right? Yeah, they get paid for what they do. They're bad guys, they take it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and yet, in Jesus Christ, it's no longer about what we do. Okay, hold on a second. So does that mean, Pastor Rob, that I don't have to come to church anymore and Jesus still loves me? Wait, hold on a second, Rob. Pastor Rob. Does that mean that I can lie to my parents and Jesus still loves me? Oh, see? Yeah, we've got some. We're not so sure anymore. Our wires are crossed. We knew JP was a bad guy, but when we're talking about us. We don't know so much anymore. Does that mean that Pastor Rob can get mad at people while he's driving on the highway and it's totally okay? Because Jesus loves him? Ooh, yeah. We have a theological conundrum on our hands. All right, sorry parents, I think I'm getting them more excited than I should. Um, can I have a next slide, please? But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Ah, so that's, it's kind of complex. Basically what he's saying here is, if we want to be with Jesus and we still sin, does that mean Jesus is bad? Yes. No. See, the kids are really good at this. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God or live to God as it's written here. So something's changed. Before Jesus, it was about what you did. Before Jesus, it was about, did you check all the good boxes? Did you not eat the right food? Did you take the right ritual bath? Did you do this thing? Did you do that thing? Because that's the best that man could do to be good, was follow a code. And that code sufficed for a time. It was a good thing. 
lot of what we believe is right and wrong comes from that code, the Ten Commandments. Don't steal. Is not stealing a good thing? Yes, don't steal. <laughs> but in our freedom in Christ, that doesn't mean we no longer should do the right thing. We are justified, yes. We cannot lose our salvation, yes. We are holy despite the mistakes we make every single day. Yes. <laughs> Call response is good. So, do you know, I'm sure I don't have to make you think of anything specifically, but how good does forgiveness feel? When I was a kid, it feels great. When I was a kid, some of your ages, a little bit older, I once skipped school. And I got caught. Because me and my friends who were also skipping school decided to walk along the main road of the town we grew up in. We're geniuses. During lunchtime. So one of our own homeroom teachers drives by. Is that? Because there were six of us. And when six kids are missing from a classroom, that's noticeable. Which... You as Sunday morning attenders just know that if there's six of you missing, there's a big hole that develops. <laughs> and so my parents were very upset with me, and so they grounded me for a whole week. There's no video games, no comic books, you know, just the worst, no dessert. Just, you don't get to hang out with James and Johnny, you are going home, and you are staying home, and you will go to your room. And at the end of that period, my parents said, you are released, we love you, we are sorry we had to punish you, but you need to learn not to skip school. And I learned my lesson, well, I didn't really, but, <laughs> but it felt so good for them to say, we still love you, we're upset with you, we want you to change, but we still love you. How good does a hug feel from someone you've missed for a long time? Really good, that's right. And sometimes your mommy and daddy <laughs> get really bad at you because you've done something wrong. Or maybe they think you've done something wrong. How good does it feel when they say, I forgive you, let's snuggle? Real good. That's right. Adults, this is for you too. Despite the things that you decide to do, when you know the consequences. Despite the sins you continue to run to, despite the filth that we, I say you a lot, and it was pointed out to me recently that when I preach, I bring the hammer down a little too hard because it's about you guys all the time. And I apologize. Every word that I preach is about me too. So I'm gonna try to start saying we, because this is for me. I don't want you guys to think that you're the bad guys, that I'm the guy that got it figured out. When we return to the garbage that defines our sin lives over and over and over again, and we feel worse and worse about it, we feel just atrocious. There is Christ Jesus still forgiving us. There is God the Father still welcoming us back, always, 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 over and over and over again. That's what grace is. Does that make sense? How often have you, maybe you're, you've been in a job where, pardon me, there is someone underneath you who's always late, or maybe a coworker who's always late, never shows up on time, always making a mess of things, never seems to try that hard. And you're like, man, they should just fire this guy or this person. That's the attitude you take towards those around you, and yet God takes an entirely different one, doesn't he? When we accept the cross, when we accept his mercy, God looks at us instead and says, I love you. I long for you to run towards me and not to the filth in your life. And this, this is Christianity 101. This is the basics. And yet it's important that we remember that. Don't you agree? Yes. Next slide, please. So we are justified by God, not by our own doing. We are justified by the cross. And then we are welcomed. That's that hug I'm talking about. Next slide, please. I have been crucified with Christ. You have been crucified with Christ. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. 
And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, who loved us and gave himself for us while we were still sinners. I do not nullify, I do not erase, I do not dull the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Just close your eyes for a moment, if you can. Just close your eyes. And picture in your mind a dimly lit space, like a cave or a dark room. That is your sinfulness. It leads to emptiness. It leads to a place where you're trapped in the dark. And then imagine a single candle and how the room gets this orange tint to it, this space, this dark space. And then imagine that candle begins to burn down into a roaring fire. And that orange hue that's bouncing off these dark walls in in your mind is getting brighter and more vibrant. You can hear the flame now. And that small fire grows into a larger one. You can open your eyes now. Christ is the light of the world. We're just, just look, it's Christmas. (laughs) Some of you are like a month ahead of us. What's Christmas? A celebration of Jesus Christ, of God himself coming into flesh and becoming the light of the world. That little picture you had in your head of the darkness, that was man without Christ. And through the cross, we now have a roaring fire that makes us beacons into the darkness. We don't just throw stars on the top of our trees because it's mentioned once in the Bible about how the shepherds saw a star. Yes, that's that reminder. But why stars? Because stars are lights that can be seen from millions and millions of kilometers away. Christ is that beacon, and now that we have Christ in us, we also are to be that beacon. So kids, when you see, maybe, I don't know what Christmas movies you guys are watching these days, but when you see the star in the heavens that the shepherds could see from countries away, you are also those stars. You are beacons in your schools. You're beacons in your playgroups because you love Jesus. And Jesus wants you to shine like him. Next slide, please. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So earlier I was talking about where in your workplaces you might have that coworker that you get annoyed at, doesn't seem to be pulling their weight. And you want to be the avenger. You want to be the one that brings the consequences to that person. And yet Jesus is so much more pure than us that knows what we have done. And yet, instead of judging us unfairly, or judging us fairly, rather, pardon me, he gives himself for us. Is that scandalous? That those who aren't pulling their weight aren't kicked out but are welcomed in? Yeah, I just wonder if you don't know what scandalous means. Is that crazy? In life, we often think that we have all the information we need to make judgments about other people. We think we do. And yet Christ does, unmovably so, and loves us, welcomes us in. (laughs) <laughs> that's not the way of the world, is it? We have politicians always trying to find dirt on one another. We gossip in our own workplaces to try to make ourselves feel better about someone else that we're competing with that we just don't like. And that's the opposite of the gospel. Next slide, please. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Let this be a reminder for us, too, on the other side of the coin. Some of you are too haughty. Some of you are too proud. Some of you believe that you're too great. 
the opposite of true of some of you in this room. Some of you are too down on yourselves. Some of you, despite believing in Christ, having him in your heart, and having the Holy Spirit say, I will never be nothing more than a sinner. And that's contrary to the gospel too. What you do cannot nullify the light that Christ has planted in you. You are justified and then you are welcomed. So your, your bad habits cannot nullify that light in you. Your running away from obedience from God cannot nullify that light in you. And some of you as parents, this is breaking your heart because there's someone in your life that seems to always be running away. And I say to you that we should continue to pray and always be there for them. But know that there's always hope. There's always hope and understanding that Jesus' judgment, Jesus' knowledge is greater than your own. And as a parent, that's hard sometimes to let go of. To entrust your child into God's hands, not your own knowledge, is very difficult. I mean, my daughter is two years old, and I can't even do it. <laughs> I have one. Some of you have many, and they're older, and they're making choices that you just don't understand. And you have to trust them to Jesus. Next slide, please. Lastly, we are connected. We are justified, we are welcomed, and we are connected. Galatians chapter 3 now. Next slide. Thank you. Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish Pathway Church Cambrian. Oh, foolish Calgarians. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. You have seen it. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? How many of you, when you accepted Jesus Christ, did it on your knees, racked with tears? Or did you figure it out on your own? Did you figure out the secret formula that now I feel better about my life, now I've received the Holy Spirit, I have hoodwinked Jesus? Nope. You have received it as a gift. Are you so foolish? Uh, verse 3. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So kids, do you ever pray? What do you pray for? Yeah, I see a hand back there. <laughs> what do you pray for? Just tell me anything. Your family, that's wonderful. Anything else? For food, for friends? I had a Greek exam the other day. I prayed for that. <laughs> at a test. Sometimes, though, I should have prepared, and the prayer doesn't really help me, and God wants me to learn something. <laughs> but prayer is beautiful, people, because prayer is an act of surrender, isn't it? It's saying, God, I need you. God, I thank you for the things you have given me, whether it's food or friends or my family, whether it's a job, whether it's a trial going through. God, give me help. If you have a prayer life, but next to it you have a life where you feel justified on your own merit, one of those things isn't fully formed. Does that make sense? Do you pray every day, but do you also feel justified by your own actions? Well, you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, if you pray, you should also recognize that you are surrendering, you are giving up. And yet some of you have a very stunted prayer life because you haven't released your righteousness to God. You say, Jesus, I pray, I pray to you, give me the things that I need. But those people over there, they live sinful lives, and they are wrong, and they don't know you. Ooh. Jesus said something about that, didn't he? The Pharisee who stands in the temple, knows all the right words to say, is tearing off his clothes, looks so humble to the outside world. Looks like a pastor, waving his arms about it on stage. 
And Jesus says his prayers are not heard. But yet of the humble man who comes in, who comes in low, who prays for himself very quietly, very low, his prayers are heard. Why does Jesus tell us that? Because you cannot be justified of your own belief and yet have prayers that are effective. You can't on one hand say, God, help me, and on the other hand say, I know better than any other man. That's a, that's a misunderstanding. You should pray instead, God, I need you because you have given me everything, my salvation also. And so that goes with your coworkers, that goes with your other students, the ones that drive you crazy, the ones that do things that hurt you. You're supposed to honor them Love them and pray for them also. In Ephesians it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Who here loves stickers? Yeah, I love stickers. You don't really love stickers? You're kind of, I understand. Did you know, kids, that if you decide to believe in Jesus with your heart and you ask him to live with you, that he forgives you of all the wrong things you've done and he gives you the sticker of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> now, can you take stickers off of things when you've stuck them on? Yeah, it's pretty easy. It's just paper, right? Just whoop. But the crazy thing about the sticker of the Holy Spirit is it can't be taken off. So in the Bible it says a seal, right? Like an the, the envelope with a candle wax, you stick your seal on it, and it, if it gets opened, you know about it, or it can't be opened in some cases. That's the Holy Spirit. If you believe in Jesus, you receive the, the everlasting sticker of the Holy Spirit. It's a sign to others, and it will not leave you, that Jesus loves you, that God has chosen you for himself. Not by the flesh, not by the things you do. We're Christians. We shouldn't believe in karma. <laughs> we believe instead in grace, that even though we are broken, we are sinners, we fail over and over and over again, God still loves us. Is this easy? Yes. Have you heard a million sermons about this before? Yes. The difference is, are you letting it change how you treat others? Or do you just come to church once a week and get a high five from the pastor? We're teaching Luna how to use the potty right now. And so we reward her with chocolate. So we'll say, Luna, go pee-pee or poo-poo. And if you do, we'll give you a chocolate. And she just brightens up. Chocolate? <laughs> right? She's just thrilled. Like, and then she'll try. And I'm sorry if this offends anyone. So she'll try. She'll go, hmm. Which I don't know where she gets that from. It's not like we've ever been like, this is how you try, Luna. Like, it just came, I don't know, maybe, maybe someone else taught her or something. But when she really tries and she really wants that chocolate, she goes, hmm. And most of the time these days, nothing really happens. This morning she did. High five. Yay, she got chocolate. The hardest part of that whole exchange is when she doesn't use the potty, she still asks, chocolate? And mommy and daddy have to be really strong and say no. And that's how we think of the world. You do this thing, you get this reward. Luna used the potty, she gets a chocolate chip. Rob, you did a good job at work this week, you can take a day off. Your, you know, your yearly appraisal comes up or your yearly assessment, you get a pay raise of 15 cents. Good job. And that's not how the kingdom works. Isn't that absurd? Yes, yes, amen. And yet, it's the truth. I'm going to invite the team up as I wrap up here. You're, some of you are going to fall victim to something this Christmas. 
you're going to fall victim to a thing the world has made. The war on Christmas. You're going to be upset because, some of you anyways, because someone said happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. You're going to share some pictures about how the real thing about Christmas is Jesus and all the other people have got it wrong. You're going to go on Facebook and your Instagram and you're going to share memes that don't communicate anything whatsoever beyond the fact that these Christians are crazy. I don't want to challenge you to do something else different this Christmas. I want you instead to not care about the war on Christmas, to not care about whether there's less Santa Clauses or less, sorry, more Santa Clauses than there are Jesuses, or that they don't do the nativity at that one place that you liked anymore. We're not supposed to care about that stuff. We're supposed to care for the people who don't actually know the Christmas story. And we're not going to change their hearts by getting crotchety. You're not going to change their hearts by becoming Scrooges. There's a story about that, I think, somewhere. You're going to change their hearts by showing them love. You're going to change their hearts by showing them compassion. You're going to change their hearts by showing them exactly what Christ has shown you. Not by getting your undies in a bunch about what some cashier said to you, but instead to show compassion to your friends that don't know Jesus that think Christmas is just about trees and being nice to people and Charlie Brown. But instead that Christmas is about this idea that God loves us each so much he became man and died on the cross for us. That is Christmas. It's not a greeting. It's not a Christmas tree. It's not your favorite special not being shown on the CBC anymore. It's showing compassion and love and never an unflinching, pardon me, unflinching forgiveness saying, I forgive you over and over and over again when someone wrongs you. Are you tired of forgiving, you say? Tough luck. God doesn't say, I'm tired of forgiving. And we're supposed to be like him. Pray with me. Dear Jesus Christ, you are good. You are living You love us. You love these kids. You love their parents. You love their grandmas and grandpas. You ask us to believe also in you. And in that belief, an amazing thing happens. When we say, Jesus, I believe in you, you send us the Holy Spirit. You send us power. You send us compassion. You send us strength when we feel like we have no strength left. Whether we're 9 or 99, the Holy Spirit gives us what we need to accomplish love. We no longer live, but Christ lives in us. We are no longer dictated by the works of the flesh, but by the works of Christ Jesus. Even though we sin every single day over and over again, we are alive in Christ Jesus. It is not about whether we did the right thing or the wrong thing, but about, but about we have grace lavished continually on us. And through that grace, we can connect with the living God. And that is amazing. Help us all, no matter what age we are, to love like you have loved. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Jesus crucified.